I'm Lori Creever. Welcome to our interview with New York Times health columnist, Jane Brody. Today we're going to be talking about her book, Jane Brody's Guide to the Great Beyond. Thank you so much for coming in to talk with us. My pleasure, Lori. It's always a pleasure to be in the Twin Cities. Wonderful. Now, I want to start by asking you, over the years, we know you as a health mm -hmm. columnist, a health educator, really. This seems like such a departure. How did this come up that you decided to write about death and dying and end of life? It's not at all a departure <laughs> because you're born, you live, and you die. And as healthfully as you may live, as great a lifestyle as you may pursue, eventually the end will come. And the, the sooner you are prepared for it, and the better you are prepared for it, the easier it will be not only for you, but also for all the people who love you, your survivors. Um, there is no cure for mortality. No matter what <laughs> medicine may tell you, they don't know how to stop you from dying. Oh, what an injustice. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, just sitting here and approaching this topic, my palms are sweating. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a great read. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's like buying life insurance. Why do you think, or what have your readers told you that it makes it so difficult for us to confront yeah. this topic? We live in a death-denying society. And unfortunately, you know, a century ago, most people died at home surrounded by their loved ones. Mm. Children saw people die. Everyone was familiar with the fact that life does end sooner or later. Yeah. And now, for the last half, half century at least, people have been dying mostly away from home, in hospitals, yeah. surrounded by strangers, fitted with all these tubes and apparatus that, that sort of take away their humanity. And so we, we have just divorced dying from living. And so we're afraid of it. And yet, people who have come to terms with the fact that life does eventually end, and sometimes it ends too soon, but sometimes it ends too long into the future. I mean, there are people who do live too long and will say to you, I have lived too long. I should have, I should have left this, this earth sooner. Um, the last few years have not been worth living. Uh, so we have to deal with both of those kinds of issues. But, the other part of the problem is that doctors tend to be death deniers. They, they tend to be the worst death deniers because they're schooled to, to save lives, to heal to, you. To heal, to save lives, and they don't have a script for dying. And so they go off stage when people are dying. Yeah. They don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Now, there are some doctors who do. Obviously, it's not universal. There are some doctors who will stay with you, hold your hand, say, I'm with you to the end. But far too many uh, depart the stage. Something I find interesting in the book is that you suggest anyone over the age of 18 should have, is it a living will and, and is it called an advanced directive? There, it's an advanced directive. And advanced directives come in two forms, and they're both important. One is the living will. And that spells out under what circumstances you want life-prolonging treatment um, and on what circumstances you wouldn't want life-prolonging mm -hmm. treatment. That's really important. And I spell out in this book the, the, how to fill out your living will so that it's understandable by the medical profession. So many of us have living wills that the doctors don't know how to interpret. Yeah. So that's number one. But that's not enough because you need somebody who is you when you can't speak for yourself. And that person is called many things. It's called a healthcare proxy or healthcare agent, also called someone who holds dual power of attorney for your healthcare. Mm -hmm. And when you cannot speak for yourself, that person is you in the eyes of medicine and the eyes of the law. And that person then can say, this is what we're to do now with this patient and not something else. And of course what comes to mind, perhaps one of our more famous cases, the young woman in Florida, Terry, Terry Schiavo. Schiavo. Absolutely. Now here's a, here's a classic case, and why do I say 18 and over? Because that's the age of majority. Terry Schiavo was 26 years old when she suffered a heart attack that, and, and was not breathing long enough for her brain to be destroyed, the cognitive part of her brain, so that she had no human mental function. Yeah. She was more, just a vegetable. And 
she was kept alive for 15 years on a feeding tube to the great expense of society yeah. and to the great emotional as well as financial expense of her husband and her parents who fought they for most of those 15 sides, years. Right? Absolutely. For most of the 15 years, they fought with one another as to whether to disconnect that feeding tube. And the doctors all through this knew that she could never come back. Never. No, there was never. no yeah. there was no cognitive function left. That part of her brain wave was flat. Well, I think something that you're inviting each one of us to do, if we can't seem to face this topic for ourselves, is to face it for those that we love and that we're going to leave behind. Let's talk about that. Absolutely. I mean, if you are, um, as so many of us are, members of the sandwich generation, you have young children and you have elderly parents. Um, hopefully you still have them all, but maybe you don't. In any case, whoever is left, uh, those are the people for whom this is so critically important. And, it, you know, I don't think it's too early any time to do this. Not for you either, because yeah. sweaty palms or not, it's much easier to do when you are healthy and young. Yeah. When you don't have death imminent. And these advanced directives can be changed at any time. Sure. It's yeah. not an irrevocable statement that you've made once and for all and you're never going to revisit them. You can revisit them as often as you like. The important thing, though, is if you change them to make sure that the other copies your are destroyed. Person. Oh, the other copies yes. are destroyed. Right. And you also make a good point. It seems like we would put this in our safe deposit box, but you say, no. Who's no. going to find it? If you're, yeah. hit, if you're struck by a vehicle right. and, heaven forbid, yeah. you're in a comatose state, right. then who's going to find this in your safe deposit box? Exactly. It really should be as close to your person as possible. My husband and I carry our health care proxies in our wallets. Mm -hmm. And I suggested it also go in the glove compartment, mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, especially if you live in a community where you drive a lot. Yeah. Um, New York City, where I live, we're not in the car so much. The wallet is a much more important place to yeah. have it. But cars are a good idea, too. Keep it in the glove compartment in case there's an accident. So somebody knows who comes. The emergency vehicle knows whom to call right. and what to do. What and, to do. Right then and there. Now, we're sitting talking in mm -hmm. the Twin Cities of Minneapolis mm -hmm. and St. Paul. And I remember when this came into mm -hmm. being here, mm -hmm. and it was a very nice movement on the part of our health care providers where when you would come in for your annual appointment, they would prompt you to, to fill one of these mm -hmm. forms out, very instructive, mm -hmm. and you do have instructions in the book as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a good idea to make sure your, your regular clinic, your regular physicians and health care providers have this. It's, oh, absolutely. Your health care, your primary care doctor, certainly. And when you go into a hospital for any reason, you know, for, for any minor procedure even, to make sure that that in your medical record is a copy of your health care mm -hmm. proxy and that your the person you've assigned to be your health care proxy, and preferably two people, just mm -hmm. in case the primary one isn't available. Yeah. But they must be in agreement. You don't want you have to have two people who don't agree with one another, and you don't want to have anybody who doesn't agree with what you want, because that person is you when you can't speak for yourself. Right. It, I mean, it's, it's easy for us, I think, to play out the scenarios in our mind of how difficult it would be that you have an exact idea of mm -hmm. how much or how little life support measures mm -hmm. you'd want applied. But somebody standing next to your hospital bed, your parent or your sibling or your spouse, who cares about you deeply and doesn't want to lose you, isn't ready for you to go yet, mm -hmm. they might have a completely different idea. And that's why this person has to be on your side. This person has to agree with you. And, you know, it's really important, and that's why I spell out how to fill out this living will in such great detail, that you don't want... If you, you say do not resuscitate for X, Y, Z reasons, um, you don't want to not be resuscitated if you have a good chance of recovery. Right. Um, there's a story in the book, for example, of a woman who, who had um, a terminal illness, but it wasn't going to kill her anytime soon. And she had a do not resuscitate r listing in her living will. And the doctors weren't going to treat her when she got pneumonia which was a big, big mistake. Because it's treatable. It, it's treatable, and she wasn't ready to die. She, was, she could live months, years even, 
with this terminal illness. She wasn't at, on her deathbed. Right. On the other hand, if she was on her deathbed and she gets pneumonia, you don't just start putting in all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. There's great truth and wisdom in your book. And I think one thing to spend some time on is help us to get reality on these subjects which is not what we see when we watch television programs. Ah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I talk about, in, I have a chapter on coma, and I talk about the sleeping beauty effect. Yeah, the every soap opera, I mean, has yeah. somebody who's been in a coma for a and they while, emerge. and then Ma they emerge. A miracle happens. and Well, unfortunately, these miracles don't happen all that often. There are many kinds of comas, and that's what I explained. Yeah. There are comas in which you are likely to emerge in a matter of weeks or months or maybe even a couple of years, but the doctors can tell mm -hmm. what kind of condition you're going to be in when you come out of that, if you are going to come out of it as they could tell with Terry Schiavo, that she wasn't going to come out of it in any kind of condition that resembled a human being. Yeah. She was a human being in form only, but not in mind. Yeah. In mind, I mean, I think really earthworms had more of a consciousness than mm -hmm. she had. Mm -hmm. This is Lori Creever signing off, inviting you to read a book. It could change your life. And let's encourage our children to do the same. Thank you. You can find additional books by Jane Brody at bookstores and your public library. Titles include The New York Times Guide to Alternative Health, a consumer reference, Jane Brody's Good Food Gourmet, Jane Brody's Good Seafood Book, and Jane Brody's Good Food Book.